Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Thanks very much to Aaron for the opportunity uh, to speak here. I've really had a, a great visit. It's been really fun talking with, with lots of people in the in the department. Um, um, and Aaron actually was an undergrad at Wisconsin, so it was uh, it was nice just chatting chatting with him uh, about uh, Madison last night at, at uh, dinner. Uh, so um, so the work I'm going to talk about today. First thing I want to do is show my acknowledgement slide because uh, I always forget if I do it at the end. So most of what I'll talk about today was done by uh, Daniel Florian, who is a postdoc with me. Uh, he's now at University of Houston. Alec Leneau, who graduated uh, just this past spring, he's now postdoc at UCLA, and, and uh, Kevin Zhang, who's at who's at uh, 3M. So you know they're the ones who who did the work. And most of most of my talk today is based on work that was supported by the Office of the Secretary of of Defense. And um, so this you probably recognize this, Aaron. So this is Memorial Union Terrace on a lovely summer day. That's my group. Um, okay. So um, before diving into the, the specifics of, of what I'll talk about today, uh, I just kind of want to give an overview of the kinds of things here. Let me get my movies going here. Um, the kinds of things that my research group is interested in overall. And, and so we're interested in um, uh, fluid dynamics, rheology, uh, soft matter systems at a at a variety of different scales. So we, some of our work is on rheology and microhydrodynamics. I have a project on uh, blood flow, a project on basically using the same kinds of tools that I'll talk about today, but in the context of learning um, to represent the microstructure in complex fluids. Um, some work on various types of interesting little objects in flow. There, this is a sedimenting sheet, flexible sheet, which does fun things as it's as it's uh, as it's sedimenting. Uh, this is actually a flow instability in uh, a surfactant solution. So, um, got a lot of different things going on in my group. The 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 threads that that unify all of these different things are um, you know, at some level um, fluid dynamics, fluid structure interaction. We use computations and, and theory. Um, and a fair amount of what I do has some connection with some aspects of nonlinear dynamics, instabilities, chaotic dynamics. And so that's gonna be the focus of my, of my talk today. So just as a bit of um, background, so we're interested in, in making, um, models, predictive models for, uh, for complex systems. In particular, we're interested in systems that at least nominally have a very large number of, of degrees of, of freedom. They may be very complex in, in space, uh, space and or, or time. And if you wanted to do fully resolved uh, simulations, those would be quite uh, computationally demanding. So the, a couple examples. Um, like I said, one of the things we're interested in is uh, microstructure in, in flowing complex fluids. So if you have a, if you have a polymer solution, you like to keep track of the the distribution of orientations and stretching in that in that fluid during flow. And so that's we're trying to characterize this time dependent and spatially dependent probability density function. That's the picture on the the picture on the left is actually a prediction of a of a scattering pattern in a complex flow. The the focus of today's talk will be uh, turbulent fluid flow, where we have many many degrees of of freedom, um, and even the simulation of a rarely simple turbulent flow might take nearly a million degrees of freedom. And then of course, you know, turbulent flows of, of engineering interest, if you wanted to do a large scale direct simulation of those, those would be, you know, tens of millions more or more degrees of, of freedom. And then of course, one thing that we're all familiar with and interested in is predictions of, of weather and climate. So those are the kinds of things that we're, that, that we're aiming to be able to say something about. And so what we're gonna, what I'll talk about today is, is data-based modeling of, of complex systems. Um, the focus, focus will be the middle here. And what we really wanna do is determine what are the essential degrees of freedom in the system and, and, um, and, then, and then find the evolution equations 
for those. And I'll, I'll show one, one application where we'll use this reduced model uh, to help design a, uh, a control algorithm, all right? So that's kind of the overall, overall basis. Slide my one over here. Okay, so um, so how are we going to do this? So we want to we want to build on some really fundamental central ideas from from nonlinear dynamics, and and so the the, the ideas um, come from from the from the following. If we have data that lives in some very high dimensional state space so so for a for a flow system the state space would be the velocity uh, uh, at every at every point in space that's that's a point you know the velocity at every point in physical space that's a point in the state space of the navier stokes equations right if you just have some mechanical system then the positions and the momenta are the are the the, the elements of the of the state space in that system and, and so we're going to build on the idea that even for these very complex systems, that there's some lower dimensional surface in that state space where the data actually lives, all right? And in particular, for things like, um, well, for, for, for systems that dissipate energy, um, dissipative dynamical systems, uh, this is going to be true in, in a wide variety of simulation in situations. In some cases, you can prove it to be true. In other cases, you can't mathematically prove it to be true, but you expect it to be true on physical grounds. So, so for example, um, in the Navier-Stokes equations, you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It's a partial differential equation. But um, even if you start with very rough initial conditions with structure on very small scales, you expect that after a short amount of time, Viscosity is going to smooth out the smallest scales in the system, and you will no longer have to worry about those. All right, so there'll be some finite number of degrees of freedom, and and so and the the way you describe uh, these these uh, surfaces where the the dynamics live, they're so-called invariant manifolds. So a manifold a manifold is just a generalization of a of a curve or surface. So it's anything that to that you can locally represent. With Cartesian coordinates. Now, you might not be able to globally represent the whole shape with one set of Cartesian coordinates, but you but you can do it locally. And we'll get to the issue of local versus global um, later. But for example, you know, so the the torus here, the surface of a of a donut, that's a two dimensional manifold. Locally, you can put down a little patch and describe the surface with Cartesian coordinates. Globally, you can't use Cartesian co coordinates to cover the whole thing. You can't use polar coordinates to cover the whole thing because if you go around, you go from zero to two pi and then back to zero. So there's a discontinuity in your co coordinate system there. And so um, you can either embed that manifold in, in higher dimensions, three in this case, or if you want to stick with the two-dimensional representation, you have to work with local representations, local patches. And we'll come back to that later, okay? All right, so, so what we're going to be interested in is finding these surfaces in state space where the, where the dynamics live. Um, and then we're going to be interested in making um, uh, finding evolution equations for the dynamics on that lower dimensional surface. Okay, so that's going to be the idea. So here um, you can think about some complex system, high dimensional state space. Initial conditions eventually lie on this smaller, lower dimensional surface. And this is kind of a blow up here. We'll call this surface M, all right? And then the, the, the dynamics, so initial conditions out here will eventually collapse down onto this surface. So that's the basic picture to, to think about. Um, and then the, this, this is just a little um, system of three, div three differential equations that has at long times, there's a stable oscillation, which in state space is just a limit cycle, just a closed curve. And I've shown a bunch of initial conditions that just collapse down onto that closed curve, which is a one dimensional manifold. So locally, you can represent that with one Cartesian coordinate, all right? Um, so we're gonna use machine learning tools to, uh, to represent our, our these, these manifolds in there and the dynamics on them. 
And the idea of, of, of data lying on manifolds is kind of a, a very widespread idea in, in machine learning. And there's this so-called manifold hypothesis, which is basically the idea that, you know, if you think about, um, you know, just images, 100, 100 by 100 pixel images, like, you know, would be on Facebook, you don't need to care about the vast majority of possible images that are 100 by 100 pixels, because the vast majority of those images will look like noise to a human. And the images that we really care about look like people, or they look like cats, or they look like cars. So there's a, there's a low to, relatively low dimensional part of this enormous dimensional space where the data that you care about actually lives. And so that's, that's an idea that's been that's been built on in the machine learning community and is used basically as as one argument for for why machine learning tools have been so successful at data driven um, representations and 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 uh, and models. All right. One point that I'll make, and we'll come back to this later, is unless the data is very simple, we don't know in advance uh, how many dimensions are required to to capture that that data. All right. So, so this is kind of the, the the overall geometric picture that we want that I want you to think about as as I'm as I'm going through this. Um, eventually, the manifolds will be in too many dimensions to draw pretty pictures of. All right. So the other thing that we want to take advantage of is is uh, symmetries. So we can. So one thing about data driven methods is that that you want to use your data uh, efficiently. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so you want to be smart about about how you use the data, and so if you you can exploit various types of symmetry to make better use of data. And as engineers, one example that we all know about that we don't necessarily associate it with symmetry is is dimensional analysis. Right? We know right, this is this is this is drag coefficient versus versus Reynolds number, and we know over this ten um, decades here. That's not from one set of data, right? That's from data from an enormous range of, of, of sizes of, of spheres, but we can collapse it all onto the same curve. And that's because there's a symmetry in physical laws that the law shouldn't depend on the particular units that you measure properties in. And so that's an, an example of what's called dilation symmetry, right? And so that, knowing that your law shouldn't matter whether you're using meters or, or inches, to represent units of length, that allows you to reduce, you know, all of these parameters down to two parameters. So, so we know as engineers how to make efficient use of data through dimensional analysis. Um, we can also make efficient use of data using using other kinds of, of of symmetries that are more familiar. And so, so one is if we have a periodic domain, like um, I have to admit, I, I gave this talk last week. Uh, in uh, in Evanston, and this is the Ferris wheel from Navy Pier in Chicago. So that's that's why that's that's why that's still there. I couldn't find a good example from Ann Arbor. Um, so when you have periodic boundary conditions and translation invariance, right? We can we can separate the data into a pattern and then just a phase angle, right? A, a, a shift of that of that same pattern, and so that allows you to make much more efficient use of data. And we'll we'll do that in particular. Right, we don't have to learn uh, separate representations of the same pattern shifted. We can learn one pattern, and, we, and then we can just learn what the what the phase angle is, or what the what the phase shift of that uh, of that pattern is. So that allows you to make much more efficient use of 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 your data. And the other thing is that symmetries in physical space lead to symmetries in in state space. Uh, so here, this is just this is the state space for the pendulum. There's the pendulum hanging down. This is the pendulum, the inverted steady state of the pendulum. And just because of the geometry of the of the pendulum, if we know what's going on in this quadrant of state space, we know what's by symmetry. We know what's going on everywhere. All right. And so this is a much more uh, um, complicated example. This is a this is a spatially forced uh, Navier-Stokes equation. We have we have there's certain symmetries in the Navier-Stokes equation, symmetries in the forcing, and so in this case, this is chaotic dynamics of this Kolmogorov flow. But actually, all of these different um, the different colors here, those actually can be mapped by symmetry into this one um, segment 
of state space. So only we only need to learn to represent the data and then the dynamical model in one part of state space rather than having to learn it everywhere. And so that leads to much more efficient use of, of, uh, of data, all right? So those are, those are the, the key things that we're gonna think about. We're gonna think about this manifold idea that the data lives on some lower dimensional surface. We're gonna take advantage of symmetries in the system. And then, and, then, and then the last little bit of background, some people will know this material better than, better than I do, but we're gonna use neural network representations for various aspects of what I'll talk about today. So I just wanted to um, introduce a very simple neural network and basically introduce some vocabulary that I'll that I'll use in the course of the in the course of the talk. So the basic thing to think about is we've got we've got data vectors. We've got x's and, and y's, and we want to find um, a representation from that data. We want a functional representation. Y equals f of x. So what's what's f? All right. So it turns out that um, very general class of functions can be represented with what's called a single layer neural network. So here are our inputs here, our Xs. W is a um, just a, a matrix that we're gonna learn from the data. This is gonna be part of our regression problem. So there's a weight matrix here. There's a so-called bias vector here. So this piece here, this is just a linear transformation, an affine transformation if you include this. Right, and then sigma is just a nonlinear function operating on this new vector, okay? And then this quantity H, which comes from this nonlinear operation after this linear operation, that's the hidden layer. And so that, that's called the latent variable in this system. That's the, that's, that's the or hidden, hidden variable. Okay, so that's an internal representation. And then there's one more in the single layer neural network. This is the single hidden layer here. And then to, to get your output, you just have another linear transformation. There's another ma weight matrix W and another bias. All right. And so that's your functional form. And so what we want to do is do a regression on that. We want to find the, the, the elements of W1 and W2 and, and B1 and, and B2. And so training the neural network corresponds to um, minimizing a loss function. In this case, so y tilde is our predicted function value. Y is the, is the output data. And so our loss function is just the, 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 the squared error between the, the prediction and the, and the data, all right? And the main tool that's used to find a good solution to this regression problem, it's really remarkably simple. So this is, this is just some scalar function. We wanna minimize that scalar function. And the way you do it is just by iterating and taking steps downhill on that, on that landscape, right? Through, through, just, through just gradient descent, right? You're at some place you find, you find the, the gradient of this loss with respect to the parameters and you take a step downhill and then you just repeat that. And there are all sorts of fancy tricks for that. So you can take on averages over batches of data that makes it stochastic gradient descent. And then the, the real trick that makes this very powerful is basically a fast algorithm that'll do the chain rule and allows you to take these derivatives of very complicated functions. All right, but that's it. It's just, th this, this, is, this, is the this is the work course of learning um, neural network representations. It's just going downhill on this, on this loss surface, okay? And then there are various activation functions that go in here, various nonlinearities. Or if you use a linear function, you just get, it's a linear regression problem, right? But the powerful, the powerful case is these nonlinear activations, and in particular, this one called the rectified linear unit. This will lead, a, so it's, it's a piecewise, oops. It's a piecewise linear function. So it'll give you a piecewise linear representation of, of that of that function there, right? So this relatively simple structure, this, this is kind of the building block for, for lots of things involving um, machine learning with neural networks, okay? All right, so what are we gonna do? Um, so this is sort of the manifesto that, that describes the approaches that we're, gonna, that we're gonna take. So we want to take data sets, um, and we want to find the we want to find a representation of the surface where that data 
lives. And so as a practical matter, what that means is just finding a coordinate transformation between the original state space and this, this surface, okay? And then another coordinate transformation that takes you back from that surface to the original variables, right? It's like if you have data that lies on the surface of a sphere, you wanna go from three Cartesian coordinates to, to two to spherical coordinates, right? So polar angle and, and azimuthal angle, right? Um, and we want, if you do that correctly, if the data actually lies on that surface, then you're then you have a representation with no approximations other than the approximations that go into doing the coordinate transformation. Okay, um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, using local representations in cases where we have very complicated uh, things going on in in state space. And then once we're in that lower dimensional representation, we want to find a dynamic model of the of the behavior now in this lower lower number of of uh of variables in our case um the, the the systems that we're going to care about are systems that come from that are that are represented by ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations which means that if you know the initial condition then you can predict the future you don't need any past information so that means these are Markovian. So I shouldn't I shouldn't need past history to make a prediction of the future. Okay, um, and then and we don't want to take time derivatives. We we don't uh, time derivatives. Well, derivatives from data are um, noisy, right? We all know that, and so we'd like to avoid taking them if uh, if possible. Then build in symmetries. I'll show an example where we're going to use one of these lower order models uh, for a control. Uh, algorithm. And so, you know, this is ultimately, these are the kinds of questions we're interested in, in addressing. Okay. I should mention just, just uh, in uh, you know, full disclosure, there, the, these ideas of, of finding invariant manifolds where data lives, we're not the only ones working on this in particular, Giannis Kevrakidis, Petrus Kumansakis, George Haller are among the, the, the group of other people doing very interesting things with, with somewhat related uh, ideas as ours. Um, and then there are a number of other approaches that are being used that, that, that are kind of different from, from, the, from what I'll describe. Um, so people may have heard of dynamic mode decomposition. So DMD, that's a linear, uh, linear model. Um, there are extended versions of that. And, ev and eventually there's representations based on this so-called Koopman operator formalism, where now you have a, you have a space of observables and you want to find the evolution of, of, of various observables. The advantage of that um, is that that evolution equation is linear. Uh, so if you have tools for linear control, this is a great framework for that. The disadvantage is that it's infinite dimensional. E even if your even if your differential equation is very low dimensional, the Koopman operator is an operator on functions on on arbitrary observables. Oops. So you have an infinite dimensional representation. So there are, there are, there are plus and minuses of this, of this approach. And in particular, it struggles uh, with, with chaotic dynamics for reasons that we can talk about. Um, there's a very successful uh, and widespread method called CINDY, uh, sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. So this one, um, basically, if you have data on your state and time derivatives, then you can do sparse regression to find a simple expression for the right-hand side in your set of differential equations. So this is very nice, right? It's a very straightforward approach to use, it's used in a wide range of systems. Um, so it, 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 it uh, uses a, a pre-specified structure. And in terms of learning right-hand sides of complicated uh, dynamical systems, it it's, it's has limited, um, limited applicability, especially for the, the, the situations where we're that we're interested in where we have a manifold with arbitrarily complicated shape and then different dynamics on that manifold that could be very complicated, all right? And then there's another class of methods um, that are very powerful um, that come from the machine learning community. So long short-term memory networks or reser com reservoir computing. These have been very effective at time series prediction. Um, um, they use past history. Um, and that's the, so they're not reduced order models. So they're not, they're not Markovian. So this, I, this idea that you, know, you should be able to predict the future only knowing the present 
these don't satisfy that. So in that, in that regard, they're not reduced order, they're not Markovian, so they don't fall into the category of the models that we're trying to, uh, to build, all right? But that said, they're, they're very successful in many time series. Prediction tasks for very complex systems. Why do you want to restrict your study to Markovian processes? Because our, the processes we care about are Markovian. Turbulent, the Navier-Stokes is Markovian, right? The, the state space is governed by PDE, so if you have the initial condition, you shouldn't need any past history, right? So that's that's why, is it because we're interested in, in in systems governed by differential equations. Yeah. Now there are other things you can you have partial observations. You can use time delays. So you can build in history that way, right? But that's right. So that's another another story. Okay. So we want accurate reduced order representations. We want to we want to uh, satisfy the Markov property. We want to use data that's um, that's sparse in time. We don't we don't want to have to estimate time derivatives. From, from data. And so I have one, this is one sort of technical slide. Uh, this is the basic approach that we're that we're taking. So there are two pieces to this approach. So we, we imagine that we've gathered a whole data set. Okay, so we've done a we've done a DNS, we've done an experiment, so we have lots of data, time series of, of fairly high dimensional uh, data. So that's U. And then we're looking for a coordinate transformation, chi that takes us down to some smaller dimension. So H is gonna be our coordinate representation on, the, on this manifold that we're imagining that the data lies on. And then there's another coordinate transformation that's just the inverse of this one that takes you back from the low dimensional to the high dimensional representation. And what you wanna do is learn chi and chi tilde, or chi, chi check actually, sorry, so that the predicted output equals the the input, and so that's your loss function um, with other with other complexities. But the basic idea is you want to you want to compare the predicted output to the to the real output and find neural networks chi and chi check that minimize that error. Okay, um, in many cases we're going to work in the principal components analysis or pr uh, principal components analysis basis set. PCA basis is orthogonal. It's got good properties. It turns out to be useful uh, for, for these approaches. And then um, this is where we uh, apply these uh, symmetries. So we can split out the pattern in the phase variables, for example, for a, for a complex system. So that's part of the story. So that's the part that takes you down onto this lower dimensional surface where the dynamics live. The other part of the story is we want an evolution equation on that on that surface. And so here's our evolution equation. We just have a h dot equals g of h. Um, oops, that's super annoying. I can't. Well, next time I'll have to get back up my hard drive. Um, so now we have data, but now it's in, this, in, the, in the reduced coordinates. And so if we have data that's spaced at time intervals tau, then we wanna be able to take the data at time t1 and make a prediction of the data at time t1 plus tau, all right? And so that means integrating uh, this differential equation. And so now our loss is just the, this delta. So this delta h is just h of t plus tau minus h of t. And then this is the time integration of this differential equation from t to t plus tau, right? The complication here now is simply that our objective function um, has this integral of, so this is basically an ODE solver, the runger kutta method or something like that. And so how do we find the derivative of this complicated thing with respect to the neural network parameters for, for G? So it turns out there are a couple of ways to do that. One is with adjoint based uh, methods, which are widely used for, for optimization. Um, and so that works. That works fine. Uh, the other way to do it in the in the 20, uh, 2020s is to just do automatic differentiation right through the solver. Okay, we've done both of those. Um, in fact, this is I should I should mention this is built on a on a framework um, um, that was de that was developed by Chen et al. Um, so you can either you can either use an adjoint method or you can um, or you can use automatic differentiation, and they both work. OK, and so that's how you minimize this loss. All right. 
so so that's the basic uh, that's the basic framework. And so I'm going to go through some examples of, of application of that. So the first example um, that I'll talk about is on um, turbulent coet flow. So we've done some work that I won't talk about with simpler systems, where we've looked at how the behavior, um, how, how, how this approach performs as a function of how far the data is spaced apart, things like that. And so the, the, the punchline from that is that you can use data that's spaced about half a correlation time apart and still get good predictions. Okay, so there's a story there. I'm not going to tell that here, but that's in a, that's in a, a couple of papers that we have. So I think this is a really nice application. This is one of the things that we're really that we've been interested in for a long time. So, um, whoops. If you work on turbulence, get both of my movies going here. All right. So this is just a DNS of of turbulent pipe flow. And what you, what you observe is that the structure near the wall is, is quite coherent. So this, the blue and red here, this is just um, streamwise velocity. So the blue plumes there, those are low speed streaks as the streamwise vortices that characterize the near wall turbulence, they're bringing slow moving fluid up away from the wall. All right, so those blue plumes are that slow moving fluid that's being convected away from the wall by the quasi streamwise vortices of the near wall turbulent structure. Okay. So that basic structure and the length scales of it, those are essentially universal in wall bound and turbulence. I could have shown you a boundary layer. I could show you a channel. I could show you lots of different cases and near the wall, you see the same basic structure. So this flow here, this is really the minimal version of that structure. So this is just plain Kuwait flow, all right? And uh, this is at a Reynolds number of 400 and uh, periodic boundary conditions. This is the so-called minimal flow unit for turbulent Kuwait flow. And you can see there's one low speed streak there and then there's a high speed streak in red. Right? And there's one on average, one pair of quasi streamwise vortices. So this is all self-sustaining. This is really the, the minimal turbulence that you can get. If you make the Reynolds number lower, make the box smaller, this will just this will decay to laminar. Okay. So we want to see can we capture this, this minimal turbulent cuet flow with the framework that I've that I've described. Okay. okay. All right. And even that minimal cuet flow, uh, this was here. We got a 32 by 35 by 32 grid, three velocity components. So that's 10 to the fifth degrees of freedom for a resolved simulation uh, for this, the you know, baby turbulence, right? right. Simplest, simplest self-sustaining turbulence in some in some regard. All right. All right. So let's let's see how we do on that. Okay. So the first thing we've done, so the direct simulation is 10 to the fifth degrees of freedom. Um, and so the first thing we do is we can we can make our representation more efficient by basically by fixing that streak so that it's always at a certain position in the, in the domain. So we factor out the phase variable so we can keep track of where the vortices are separately from what they look like, basically. So we split out the pattern in the phase, so we're taking advantage of this continuous symmetry that way. We first do a linear dimension reduction step. So if you're in turbulence, uh, it's, we're using POD. If you're in data science, we're using PCA. They're the same thing. All right, so linear dimension reduction, that'll get us down to about 500 degrees of freedom with 99.8% of the kinetic energy maintained. All right, so that's our rough cut, basically to get rid of um, the, the stuff that, that really barely matters there. And then we use this autoencoder framework. Um, and in that case, we go down to dimensions of the, of the hidden layer, the internal layer, down less than 20. And what we find, is that um, at, you can, so this is this would be the error for PCA. This would be the error, this is two variations, the, the blue and the red are, are, are two variations of the, of the dimension reduction framework. And the error levels off at some small value of a few percent at, at, at a, between 15 and 20, all right? So 15, and, 15 to 20 degrees of freedom. Um, and then if you look at the structure, so here's a snapshot from a DNS, 
These are just three snapshots from DNS. The streamwise, streamwise velocity is on the center line, center plane of the flow, and compare it with the, the autoencoder, the reduced dimension results. So we took the DNS snapshot, reduced it down to 18 dimensions in this case, and then expanded it back out. And what you see here is you get very good reconstruction of the original flow. Okay, there's a little bit of error, but it's but it's really quite good. Okay. And then, so that's the dimension reduction piece. And then within these, with this low number of degrees of freedom, we can find an evolution equation. And, and so we've done that. And, and so here, excuse me. So this is that uh, evolution equation prediction. So this is now at a DH of 18, all right? Um, so this H 18 dimensional dynamical system. Uh, here's direct numerical simulation, and we did, we chose this as an example. Is this this is an example of the so-called streak breakdown process? So at t equals zero, right? You have these very nice straight streaks, so not very 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 straight quasi streamwise vortices, and then there's a time time interval where those where those vortices break down, and you get very strongly three dimensional structure, lots of energy dissipation, and then the, the, then the quasi-streamwise vortices reform, okay? And that's very characteristic of near-wall turbulence. So here's the, the, the data-driven manifold dynamics model uh, starting from the same initial condition. And what you see is it goes through very nearly the same streak breakdown process. And here, this is just mode amplitudes um, for the streak mode. So that's the zero, one mode and then the three-dimensional instability mode, the one zero mode. So it's streak and uh, instability and the low dimensional model tracks very well the, the full data through this very complex process that's going on in the near wall turbulence regime. Okay. And then the other thing uh, we've done here is you can, so we remember we, we separated the phase out. So this is just where the streak is located in the domain. And again, we can make predictions of how that how this that the location is evolving. And we do a reasonably good job. And I should say that uh, the time scale of interest here is 50. That's the correlation time for this for this flow, 50 time units. And then this is just the mean squared phase dis, uh, displacement as a function of time. That's a slope of two. Um, but you get both from the DNS and the and the and the low dimensional model. So what that says is that the phase behavior is diffusive. So basically, fa the 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 streaks are undergoing a random walk in the in the neutral di direction. Okay. So there's one example of the of the dynamics. This is really about the short term predictions, short time predictions. All right. So th the other thing that'll be of interest to us is the long time statistics. And so we can look at those as well. And so in particular, here are the Reynolds stresses and the different colors are just different, uh, different, different dimensions of our low dimensional model prediction. And um, what you see is they essentially converge onto the true result when you're about, when you're D greater than about 50. So the Reynolds stresses you can predict quantitatively from this 18 dimensional model. These are the, the POD mode amplitudes as a function, just as a function of, we have them ordered by energy. Um, again, direct simulation, and we have quantitative agreement between the DNS results and the, and the demand low, low dimensional manifold dynamics results. So in terms of the POD representation, we have negligible RMS error there. And, and you can compare this with, this is fantastic work. So John Gibson, um, actually, he, he, he was the one who really kind of charted out the dynamics of, of turbulent coet flow near the, near the onset of turbulence. So as part of his thesis, he did a POD Galerkin projection of coet flow. So you do POD, you, pr you project the Navier-Stokes equations onto those POD modes and then see how that works. And so that's the same plot as this. This is with various numbers of POD modes. And even with the thousand POD modes, they were not able to get very good agreement with the with so the black. That's the that's the uh, the DNS result. Okay, so this nonlinear dimension reduction really matters. Okay, that that's really allowing you to quantitatively capture the dynamics with, with a relatively lo low number of degrees of freedom. And then the last thing I'll point out here 
is um, these are the leading Lyapunov exponents, and they converge again when when the dimension is greater than about 15. The, the, the four leading Lyapunov exponents, which are the positive ones in this case, they all converge. Um, and so, so 1 over 0.02, that's the Lyapunov time or correlation time for the system. So that, that was where I got the 50 time units from before. Okay. And then if you just look at movies, <clears throat> There's, there's no, you, you can't tell the difference between the movie from the DNS and the, and the reconstructed movie from the low dimensional uh, simulation, okay? So then we can ask, um, well, what can we do with this, right? One of the motivations for doing this is to be able to have models that you can work with much more effectively than with the original DNS, right? And so um, just very briefly, we, we took the same system and and decided to try to try to control this. And what we did was we just put a pair of, of um, streamwise oriented jets on one wall. One jet blows, one jet sucks. They can do that. So there's a time dependent trajectory of that, but near zero net mass flux. All right. So you're not anything you're pumping in on one slot, you're taking out on the on the other. So now we have an actuated system. So in this case, you're going to have you're going to be knocking the dynamics off the attractor, off the natural place where it wants to be, and so to represent these actuated dynamics, you need a few extra degrees of freedom. So the way I think about it is, you know, if this is a surface here for the natural dynamics, you need to make that thicker to capture the the actuated dynamics. So in this case, it turns out that instead of 18 dimensions, uh, 25 dimensions gave us good a good model of the actuated dynamics. So now we've reduced the dimension from 10 to the fifth to 25, and we can use this for uh, a control policy. And what we did was to use it for a reinforcement learning um, policy. So this is everything we've done in terms of the reinforcement work, reinforcement learning work is, is standard. Um, and so basically reinforcement learning is finding a, a policy to maximize basically a, a discounted uh, reward for your system. And in this case, the reward is the negative of the drag and then the actuation penalty for the for pumping the pumping the fluid into the system. And now we can we can find this reinforcement learning policy with the model with 25 degrees of freedom rather than 10 to the fifth degrees of freedom. And so I won't go into the into the details of that. So yeah, the environment's the bottleneck in this case. So he actually did it brute force with the DNS, took a month. Um, uh, and then and then it took a couple hours on the um, once we did it on the reinforcement learning <clears throat> model. Okay. And then um, so this at this case, at this low Reynolds number that we looked at, uh, here the unactuated dynamics will occasionally laminarize. This this Reynolds number is very, very low. Um, and so just look at these two. This is the, the reinforcement learning policy um, based on the model. And this is the reinforcement learning policy based on the, the DNS. And they're essentially indistinguishable. And so these, these regions here, the drag's not zero. This is, this is deviation from laminar. Okay, so the, so the flow is laminarizing here. So what this control policy is doing is learning to laminarize the, the flow. And it turns out it learns to do it in a really interesting way. And so let's show this little movie. So here, these are the colors are just intensity. So what it ends up doing, see here there are two, two low speed streaks now. Two low speed streaks is one too many to be self-sustaining in this small geometry. There's too much dissipation associated with putting two, uh, two pairs of streamwise vortices together. So what this algorithm has learned to do is drive the state into a part of state space where the turbulence is no longer self-sustaining. And that and then and then it'll naturally go to laminar. And so, you know, we thought this was just really cool that that, that it came up with this clever scheme of of exploiting nonlinearity to uh to to drive the flow to, to laminarize. So that that was a really nice um kind of outcome of this from the physical point of view. This isn't what we were expecting, but it's quite, um, it's quite physically interpretable in terms of just the, the length scales that are self-sustaining in the, in the minimal, um, minimal channel here. Okay, 
So um, the uh, what am I doing? So uh, I mentioned this issue of um, needing local representations if you have a complicated manifold. And so my my postdoc uh, Daniel developed this this method uh, that's based on ideas that come from topology. So this has been this is classical material open to differential geometry or topology text chapter one or chapter two. We'll talk about charts and atlases. So a chart is a local region of a manifold um, where you can put down Cartesian coordinates. And an atlas is a collection of those charts that covers the whole manifold. Right? It's very nice, it's very nice language, actually. So th this is all this is all that it is. And, and so we developed a way of, of doing that and combining that with these dimension reduction techniques um, that we developed. And so in principle, this is the only way to generate a minimal dimensional representation of an arbitrary data set. You, you, you have to use these overlapping local representations. Like in the example of the torus here, right? If we want a minimum, so this is 2D, but if you want to use one set of Cartesian coordinates, you need 3D. Okay. So here, you know, here this get, this this only gets you one dimension. Okay. Maybe that's not maybe that's not enormous, but the, the principle still holds. Okay. In in, in arbitrary uh, dimensions. Okay. And so we came up with a method for doing this, where we where we divide the manifold up or divide the data up into overlapping coordinate domains. Um, we did this with a simple clustering algorithm. You can imagine much more sophisticated ways of of doing that. And then in each patch, you do this dimension reduction step and you do this dynamical modeling step. And then you make sure that the patches overlap and then you, and then you can move smoothly between them, all right? And we call this Charts and Atlases for Nonlinear Data-Driven Dynamics on Manifolds, or Candyman. So we submitted this paper to Nature Machine Intelligence. They made us take out the word Candyman. We, we, were, we had to eliminate it from everything. We couldn't, we, we couldn't even call the Git repo Candyman because Candyman has, has negative connotations as in like drug dealer. But <laughs> FizzRevV was fine with it. They didn't, they, they, didn't, they didn't care. So our second paper was in FizzRevV. They let us use Candyman. Uh, anyway, um, and so we've done this on a couple different, different cases. So this, this example, this is just a simple... Uh, this is a reaction diffusion problem that generates spiral waves, and these are time periodic. So the the the, the long time dynamics live on a one dimensional manifold. Sorry that I set that up wrong. Okay, so it's only going to go one period, unfortunately, a couple periods. But um, so the ground truth is just this limit cycle. So here, this is just pixel intensity at some point in the domain. Um, so you can represent this in with one chart, so one coordinate representation if you use two dimensions, but two dimensions is not the minimal number for this case, one dimension is. Mm -hmm. So if you try to do it with one dimension, you get glitches. And so if you look at this one, you see it, it jitters because there's no way to, to smoothly represent every point on that circle. You're, there's gotta be discontinuity somewhere. You try to do that in, with one coordinate system in one dimension. Let me show that one more time. All right, so if you look at that one, you see it's jittery. And then you can see that, you can see that here. But with our approach, we actually just split the, the limit cycle here into three overlapping regions. And then the, and then the dynamics are perfectly well represented. All right, so that's one example. These are you know, very simple dynamics, um, but this is actually a quite high dimensional system. It's a PDE, so there are, there are something like 10,000 degrees of freedom in this in the ambient space if you use 100 by 100 uh, mesh, okay? A more, a more interesting example is this um, nine dimensional model of, of again, turbulent, wall-bounded turbulence um, developed by Malis Feist and Eckhart. So this is, a, this is uh, 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 um, severely truncated Galerkin projection of Navier-Stokes. And this has nice behavior because it has these first events that are quasi-laminarization quasi events, and then in a very long time, actually laminarizes. And so in this case, what turns out to be necessary 
is to split the state space up so you have a region that captures these rare events here and the, the ultimate lamin laminarization and separate regions that capture where, where the dynamics live most of the time. All right, and so again, with this Candyman technique, we can split this into three regions, each with their own local representations. And in that case, we're able to, to much better capture these very highly intermittent dynamics than we could with the, with the one chart um, representation. And so we did things like we characterized extreme events um, without going through the, the details. So this is just a measure of false positives and false negatives and true positives. Um, so there's a very nice method from Luca Magri's group that's non-Markovian. So that's kind of the that's kind of the the case to compare with our three chart model, at least out to um, a couple Lyapunov times, works nearly as well. We get 90% uh, F score in this case, um, and then a single chart model does less well. And actually, uh, this is EDMDDL. Uh, this doesn't work uh, particularly well on this complicated. Uh, chaotic system. Okay. And then um, this system laminarizes eventually. And so you can make a, um, uh, a PDF of the survival time. You've got the true data. It's here. The three chart model actually works well at predicting the survival time out to about 150 correlation times. So this T tilde here is actually a very long time in this case. Right, so this, this representation where we split the domain up into regions where different things are going on allows us to much better capture the, the dynamics, even in this very strongly intermittent system. All right, so the last question that I'll, that I'll answer, uh, that I'll go through, I'm, gonna do, I'm gonna just gonna say that, talk about this very quickly because I'm a little low on time and this part's a little bit technical. So, you know, how many dimensions do we need? So one way is just, you know, you, you, you find um, coordinate transformations you know, to five dimensions, and then you learn a model that's in five dimensions. You do it for six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, that's what we did in the Coet flow case. And what we found is once we got to 18, it was good. All right. That's really tedious, right? That's a lot of that's a lot of work you have to do. Is there a way to um, take just take a data set and run it through an algorithm and have that algorithm tell you five? That's how many dimensions this manifold is. Um, that's still an open problem in general, but we've made a little bit of, of progress. Um, and and um, the it's it's sort of non-obvious how this how this works, but we have an analysis in a, in a paper that's going to come out soon. Um, so if you take this autoencoder structure where you have one coordinate transformation down in dimension, another coordinate transformation up in dimension. It turns out that if you add some linear coordinate transformations in the middle, in principle, those shouldn't change anything. Those are just a change of basis of your data. But they, they turn out to accelerate the gradient descent process, and they, they accelerate the solution toward low rank representations and low rank, um, low rank linear layers. So we have a little bit of theory behind that. Um, again, it's in the appendix of a paper that, that's on archive. Um, but the, the real punchline is what that allows you to do is the following. So here, this is kuramoto sivashinsky equation. And this is just, we took P, we did PCA on the data in the, in the latent space. So you reduce the dimension. Um, and this is just singular values versus index. And what you see here is that for the red case, so this is the implicit regularization with, with weight decay, um, you see that there are eight non-zero singular values, and then a drop of 10 orders of magnitude, All right? So these are zero, right? And so now this, this representation now has told you it's eight. The answer is eight in this, in this case, quite unambiguously. Whereas previous methods here, we, we, we did PCA and then a standard autoencoder they just do not show this drop in the, in the singular values at a dimension of eight. And so we've done the same thing. We can do kuramoto sivashinsky with bigger and bigger domains. Um, so it's just more and more chaotic dynamics and just look at the dimension as a function of the domain size. And the, the, the 
predictions from this method, um, again, this is just this is just singular value versus that should be index rather than rank. Um, so there are are from the data we get a linear scaling, the number of dimensions and the and the domain size in this case. And there's actually a theory that says that the scaling should be linear. All right, um, and so this is actually the first validation of that of that theory. And so now we have a step toward answering this question of how many dimensions do you need to represent the, the data? All right, and I, so I will um, wrap up with that. I've run a little bit long, uh, so I'll just read my, I'll just let you read my conclusions and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody would have. You on Zoom, feel free to uh, write questions in the chat and I'll read them out. Okay. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah. The control problem with the quet flow. Yep. Is there any reason why you should expect the reduced model to work? Because you trained it, you didn't train it under the scenario that it uh, we landed on. So we trained it. Um, so we, in that case, um, ah. We didn't train it on the relaminarization regions. The other, uh, there's another case where we did. Um, and so it should work well for a while, um, but yes. Yeah, so, so it, in some sense, it's working better than it than it ought to, in that case. But the, but the these these rare events, these events where you end up with the two vortices, those show up in the in the on the attractor. So those, if you look at, um, so if you look at input versus dissipation on this case. Average has to be one, and and in this case you get these you get these excursions out here, and so those actually those excursions are when you have um, more complicated things going on, and in particular this two pairs of of quasi streamwise vortices. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's it it does work better than it ought to in some sense. But we you know we're using the actuated the 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 model was trained on actuated data. Um, I'm just curious, like in and practice. I, yeah. Actually, it's possible you might have included the relaminarization. I actually now I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to go back if and look at the paper. Include all that training data. How practical is this if you're actually trying to control something you don't have training data for? Oh, you gotta have training data. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, but here so it just comes in. You don't have to do those many, many, many DNSs. DG. That's right. So the train. So the the advantage. That's right. You still. Um, Though even just generating the training data for the model, this, that wasn't that expensive. So what's expensive in the reinforcement learning is just going back and forth, right? You change the neural network for the control policy, then you need to run a DNS with that. And then, and so that part was very expensive. So where we saved time was you just learn the model once and for all, takes a day, and then learning the control algorithm takes, takes you know, a couple hours, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know everything. Got to have some data. That's that's right. So these are very poor at extrapolating. Uh, I have a question about the uh, the size of the of the DNS simulation. Uh, I don't read it properly. Or like it was around thirty two by thirty five by thirty two. It kind of seems small, right? Like. Uh, yeah. Remember, this is one. This is one pair of vortices. Okay. Okay. So minimal minimal flow unit. So there's not a there's not a cascade here. Yeah. That actually leads me to my question. I okay. Asked. So what are the prospects of taking this to things that are really multi-scale? So everything is chaotic that you've shown, but not necessarily multi-scale. That's right. Uh, and so that that's definitely a challenge. Um, I, so one thing that uh, is a particular challenge there is um, just having an idea of what the dimension ought to be. And so this 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 last technique that I talked about, that's we hope that that'll at least tell us, you know, what the ballpark figure is. Um, the the multi-scale, I mean, it's going to be a challenge for it's all it's always going to be a challenge, right? So so I mean what that means in our case is you just have many, many more degrees of freedom. One thing that we've done um, that sort of gets at that is we've taken we've taken cases and we've done this for Kolmogorov flow so it's um, periodically forced 2D flow 
and in in large domains, and we've developed uh, local coordinate representations and local models that just talk to each other through the boundaries. And in 2D turbulence, you can do that because the interactions are local. Um, and that actually works really well. And so you have the same model acting in a whole bunch of subdomains. They talk to each other through the through the boundaries. And so you actually see that, so there's structure on the, on, the, on the size of the whole box, which is many of these periods. And so you are seeing multi-scale structure in, the, in those cases. I hesitate to call it a cascade, but it's multi, there is multi-scale structure in that. Or uh, my postdocs can talk about that at DFD. Uh, I, mean, I don't know like uh, some of these like areas, but uh, how come the pressure was not used as a? It's incompressible flow. Okay. So if you know the velocity field, you can find the pressure. Yeah. Anything else? Maybe that's good because I think people are trying to kick us out. Okay. So all right. Thank you again, uh, for the. Thank you. Thank you.